Ghost Maps Entry 3 Pulau Ubin He's excited. I can tell, even before he takes a seat across from me. Ernest introduces himself and orders his drink. He's not the first person I've known who's actually eager to tell a story about an encounter, but it's still always surprising. I tell him so, and he laughs. And it's a good-natured laugh. The kind of laugh someone who's had to laugh for far worse in his life. I get it, he says. But I can either be traumatized by it, or I can look on a bright side. I ask him, what is the bright side? He tells me that now he's got a true blue ghost story to tell. He says he never had one, all through national service, or when he was growing up. And I survived, he says. I don't think I ever felt more alive as when I stepped onto the jetty in Changi that Saturday evening. I ask him to start from the beginning. Ernest had gone camping with his buddy Dave on the beach on the west side of Pulaubin. They'd left on a Friday night in a ferry with about five other people and the plan was to stay there till that Sunday morning. Roughing it out, they said really get a sense of what it was like to enjoy nature. Of course, he would later recall with a laugh that they'd brought enough snacks to last them the weekend. Still, it started out as good fun, making the trip, setting up camp, and getting a small fire going just in time for nightfall. Dave and Ernest shared a reasonably sizable tent. So after dinner, a couple of beers, and tipsily talking about life, they both turned in. That's when it started, Ernest says, that enthusiasm still there, even as his tone gets a touch darker. We thought they were monkeys at first, tossing shit against our tent. But then they would hear children laughing. It was off in a distance at first, almost as if it was coming from the sea. But then it slowly got closer. It never really got to be right outside the tent. But it got close enough that they couldn't ignore it. This went on for what felt like an hour. But Ernest knew it wasn't that long. Time seemed to be working differently. He tried to keep his wits about him, but Dave started to show signs of cracking. Let's just go out there and face it, he'd said. Better than this bullshit hiding. Ernest held him back. But that's when he heard it. The sound of his brother calling out to him. It was hypnotic, he says. Like I couldn't resist it. I had to go out to see Jeffrey. I asked him how he resisted. He tells me, with just a hint of sadness creeping into his voice, that whatever was out there had made the biggest mistake. Sure, my initial instinct was to go out there, he says. But the longer I held off, the more I thought about my brother, and the more I knew that he would have resisted if it had been my voice calling out to him. I nod solemnly, and gesture for him to continue. Ernest shook his head and pulled back. It was then that he realized that Dave was already huddled in a corner, covering his ears, shaking. Whatever was calling out to Ernest's friend was having better luck with him. Ernest sat next to Dave and put his arms around him, providing a tangible reason not to go out there, reassuring him that they get through the night. And they did. In the morning, the pair unzipped the tent and cautiously stepped outside. They thought they saw tracks in the sand, as if giant snakes had slithered up to where they were from the ocean. But they couldn't be sure. They had arrived too late last night and weren't really paying attention to the sand. Quickly, they packed up the equipment and tried to make their way to the jetty. It took them a while to find their way back which Ernest said he didn't want to admit at the time, was very strange. 
They had made it from the jetty to the beach without any problem in evening's fading light the night before. But it didn't make much difference, even when they finally figured out the path to the jetty. The fairies hadn't been able to come in all morning for some reason. An old uncle at the jetty made some ominous comment about something in the water. But when Ernest and Dave pressed him, he just stared out at the sea. When the ferry finally arrived, the two of them were the only ones to hop on board. By evening, they were back on the mainland. Dave didn't take it as well, Anna says with a sigh. He tells me that whatever his friend heard, he didn't want to talk about. He never pressed him about it, but when Anna came back, he had his own issues with his brother. I asked him again why, even with all the fallout, he was still so positive. He sips his drink thoughtfully, just shrugs. What am I supposed to do? Break down, he says. Might as well have stepped outside the tent that night for all the difference it would have made. He stares off absently. I imagine that's how the uncle at a jetty must have looked that day. Seeing monsters that weren't there. Anna shakes his head and his genial smile returns. Reminds me again that he now has a cool story to tell people about his camping trip to Ubin. I return the smile. But move on to more everyday topics before we part ways. If you want to discover more of Southeast Asia's other side, subscribe now. Thank you.